maybe a little bit goofy. So we're here from Cockle Dermatopathology. We're doing some unknowns. And we are going to go over the case number one, which is a punch biopsy. It was on a 10-year-old on the abdomen. We have this proliferation that's occurring in the dermis and also in the, into the paniculus. It doesn't seem to be involving the overlying epidermis, which appears somewhat thickened. There seems to be a, a slight zone of uninvolvement. And then as we get further into the dermis, we notice that there are, there's a proliferation of cells that are somewhat ovoid to spindle with nucleoli. They have somewhat of a mesenchymal appearance. And what I mean by that is that it's a primitive appearance and spindled. The other thing we notice is we can tell that this is a young person because there's minimal solar elastosis um, here. So right away we're thinking about if this is a young person and this is a 10 year old, what type of tumor would be occurring? And a differential is going through our minds. <clears throat> we're also noting that it appears that it has an, a mature adipose component to the tumor. And it also has these areas of fibrous trabeculae so it seems to be somewhat what they would call triphasic. If you look on higher power, you will see an occasional mitosis. Um, very rare, very, very rare. So some of the things that we think about is um, they also, the um, dermatologist was uh, telling us that this, this was a solitary nodule. And um, it turned out to be a fibrous hematoma of infancy. It was um, mostly um, in the subcutis and it had those interlacing fibrous trabeculae of immature spindle cells. The matrix wasn't very mucoid, but the cells did look very um, primitive mesenchymal. Um, also, you have the interspersed fat and um, typically these tumors are between birth and two years old. You can have a rapid growth, but it does not ever regress. So it's best to excise these, even though they're totally benign because they can recur. Uh, we have seen cases um, in the trunk, the arm. We've seen it in the inguinal area and the scrotum. And the differential is a connective tissue nevus, which typically you'll see a much more collagen in that. It's a collagenoma, um, also can be called a shade green patch, but you'll see a lot more collagen in that entity. So that was a pretty straightforward case. I think if you didn't know it was a child, you might think about a DFSP because you saw that Swiss cheese pattern. But I think when you go on higher power and you don't see the story form that you usually see with DFSP and a much denser cellularity that you see with DFSP, um, that would steer you away from that entity. The next case was a shave biopsy. And if you go on higher power, you'll see um, many nerve twigs. And it seems like a, this high up in the dermis there's too many of these nerves. Um, it's not in a particular location that you would have this many nerves. I mean, this was just on the arm. So this increase in these nerve twigs, which don't really have fibrosis around them, so you're really not thinking about uh, a process that might be induced by trauma. You're seeing these nerves and you're thinking possibly this could represent a neuroma, a small neuroma. How you would subclassify this, um, you could say it's just an increase in nerves possibly due to rubbing or trauma, or this could just be a, a neuroma not otherwise specified. Um, why this isn't a palisaded encapsulated neuroma? Because typically that's a solitary nodule and it has a thin connective tissue capsule. So we call this a neuroma that was not otherwise specified because we saw these fascicles of nerve twigs and some fibroplasia surrounding them. Um, it can be due to trauma, but this isn't considered a traumatic neuroma because you'll see a great deal more fibrosis around that. The differential does include dermal hypernury, um, where you see hypertrophy of the small nerves in the dermis in a pattern of dermal um, change. And typically uh, the differential might include a nevus, but a neurotized nevus, but you typically don't see that, that pattern with a neurotized nevus. Typically, you'll see some residual nevus cells as well. So this could have been due to chronic irritation or rubbing, but they may be seen occasionally in MEM2B syndrome. So think about that if you see a neuroma like that or hypernury.
case number three. This is obviously an inflammatory process. We're seeing inflammation throughout mostly the upper and mid dermis. When we go on higher power, there's a perivascular infiltrate. We're seeing innumerable eosinophils. We're also seeing lymphocytes, histiocytes, and occasional mast cell, very rare neutrophils. And some of the eosinophils are in an interstitial location. There is some edema where you'll see slight separation of the collagen. The overlying epidermis is very much uninvolved. You don't see much spongiosis at all, very, very slight spongiosis. And the keratin layer is intact with not very much change. There's not much parakeratosis, a slight increase in the keratin, but not much. Um, this end, uh, turned out to be urticaria. One of the things with urticaria is when you're looking at the slide, you must check for vasculitis and you must take a survey of what types of cells that you have there. Do you see any neutrophils? <clears throat> How many eosinophils are there? <clears throat> is there any vasculitis? So the epidermis is typically intact in urticaria. There's usually slight edema, perivascular leukocytes, <clears throat> and mild inflammation that's consistent with that diagnosis. Vasculitis and leukocytoclasia is usually not seen. If you do see it, then you need to think about urticarial vasculitis. So you can see some newts, but the newts here were not prominent at all, and an occasional mast cell. It's a very puritic process, and if it's greater than six weeks, you might want to think about chronic urticaria clinically. The classifications of urticaria, you cannot tell this on the slide, but um, this is typically for clinical, but there's an allergic urticaria where you can have contact, um, where there's ingestion of different drugs, food, animal skin, um, dust, mites, mold, insects, and then there's a non-allergic urticaria um, where you'll have physical stimulus such as heat, exercise, sun, cold, pressure, vibration, and then there's a pseudo-allergic urticaria with foods, hormones, and drugs such as aspirin, codeine, morphine, antibiotics, contrast material, and curares, dextran. Secondary urticaria can be associated with an autoimmune diseases like hypocoplamentemia, thyroid disease, cancer, and infection, and then reflex urticaria. Some hormones, such as gastrin and neurohormones, can cause urticaria, aka idiopathic type. And then there's the hereditary angioneurotic angioedema, which is rare. It's an autosomal dominant with low C1 esterase inhibitor, and you can see swelling of the lips and eyelids. In urticaria, the differential is like focal mucinosis. You'll see more mucin than we saw in this case. You can use the colloidal iron or mucicarmin to stain the mucin. You'll occasionally see mast cells in that entity. With urticaria pigmentosa, you'll see an increase in mast cells, and much, much more conspicuous than here, where you may see a scattered mast cell, but not an increase of, let's say, over 75 mast cells per uh, millimeter. Um, the trypsin stain can be very helpful with the urticaria pigmentosa. We showed one of those in the last uh, week with the unknowns. <clears throat> and erythema marginatum is also in the differential, but you have to have a history of rheumatic fever. And BP, you need to think about BP, especially if you start to see a bullus, um, a bullae forming, a, a subepidermal bullus. Um, you'll see many eosinophils in that and some spongiosis edema and early blister formation. And also drug, you need to think about a drug eruption, but in that case, you'll see some subtle interface changes, some slight spongiosis and some slight subepidermal fibrosis. With urticaria, when you see numerous eosinophils, as in this case, you might want to think about a drug reaction an urticarial allergic reaction. In that case, you'll see many, many eosinophils, and we did see quite a few, but I don't think it was enough to meet the criteria of urticarial allergic reaction. Um, the differential, again, is the BP, and if you need a DIF, you can always get a DIF, but you must have that clinical suspicion of BP to think about bullous urticaria, an early lesion that hasn't become bullous yet. Um, there's also an entity called urticaria with abundant neutrophils. And what I want you to know about this is if you see many, many neutrophils and EOs, think about neutrophilic urticaria. It was described in 1985 by Winkleman. 
It's yet to be completely defined and its clinical significance is poorly understood, but some studies associated with systemic disease, rheumatic disease and other studies refute this, but I would think about checking the patient for that rheumatic disease. Um, there may be some leukocyteclasia, but you typically will not see vasculitis or thrombosis. We're moving on to the next case, case four. Many of you may also have gotten this very quickly. Um, you might've thought, well, there's some attachment to the epidermis of these basaloid cells. And you thought about um, possibly a superficial basal cell carcinoma, possibly a tumor of follicular infundibulum. Um, but then you saw that it's not just a plate-like growth. You're seeing this nodule here with this loose stroma and these anastomosing strands. And you're also noticing some nubs of this primitive follicular stem germinative epithelium. And when you see these small nubs, you might want to think about a variant of, of, of a basal cell called a fibroepithelioma, which was named after Dr. Pincus. Um, they believe the theory was that these strands may have involved the eccrine glands. And as you see here, there's a couple of eccrine structures that are mimicking eccrine structures that are part of the tumor that might be where they got that, that idea of the, what's, how this is growing. Um, some people think that this might not be as um, malignant as a basal cell. They think it might be a trichoblastic differentiation, but at this lab, we consider this to be a variant of a basal cell and we recommend excision. Also, because these are sometimes associated with basal cells, so if the, associated with regular types of basal cells, so therefore it's best to completely excise these because down, you know, could skip over here, you might have a superficial basal um, with, and you can see retraction in these. So it does have many of the features of a regular basal cell, but this would be the fibroepithelial, uh, fibroepithelioma variant of a basal cell, the so-called pincus. Uh, tumor or follicular infundibulum, that is the one that I think is the most uh, difficult in the differential. But when you see a nodule uh, infiltrating into the dermis or pushing into the dermis, in this case, it's more pushing, I would move away from that diagnosis. Also, you don't have these nubs of uh, stem cells um, that are sticking out in these areas. So that would you wouldn't see that with a, a TFI or, or other type of follicular hamartoma, you wouldn't see this basal, these basaloid strands. So that was a fibroepithelioma variant. Um, again, you'll see the reticulated strands of neoplastic basal cells with scant cytoplasm, the fibrostroma that's so characteristic of it. Um, usually they're more nodular. That's, this was a little less nodular than I like to see. It can occur on the lumbosacral area of the back and the trunk. Um, it has a very common stromal reaction that's distinctly uncommon in other types of basal cells. And there's also a polypoid variant that you need to be aware of. And the differential we already discussed, follicular hamartoma and tumor of follicular infundibulum. Also the eccrine syringo fibroadenoma, typically those areas, the, it'll look more like a net-like pattern, very net-like and um, strands going down into the dermis and you'll see a lighter center to them, more pale eosinophilic center. That's that acrosyringeal cells. And you will see a fibrovascular stroma. So that's how it can mimic pincus. And uh, the other feature is you'll see lumina in the eccrine syringo fibroadenoma. And that's usually a solitary plaque in several centimeters in diameter on the limb. So the clinical might help you there as well. Anyway, next case is case 5.1. Um, we have an excisional biopsy here. When you see an excision, you always think to yourself, well, why are they excising this entire lesion? So that, that definitely makes you start to think, well, could this be a malignant process because they excised it? I mean, it's just a clue on a test. Always look at the biopsy type and wonder, okay, why did they excise this? I don't see a scar from a previous biopsy, but I do see this proliferation that is going into the fat. And it's a very um, homogeneous proliferation. It appears to be composed of one cell type you don't see any spindle cells in here. You see a few entrapped um, eccrine glands that the tumor just sort of proliferated around. Um, on higher power, these cells have lots of cytoplasm. It's somewhat eosinophilic and granular. The nucleus is not very central. Central in some uh, cells and other cells a little bit eccentrically located. There's nucleoli. 
<clears throat> you can see one or two nucleoli here. And the nuclei are somewhat ovoid, but they don't have great variation in size and shape between these nuclei. Um, you might think, well, maybe this is a xanthoma. Um, I'm not 100% certain that this is granular and it doesn't look very eosinophilic on the stain. It looks a little bit basophilic actually. So you might be a little bit unsure um, of what this is. I mean, could this be a xanthoma? You might be thinking, but I, and also the differential is a granular cell tumor. So you might want to put an S100 stain on it to see if um, it stains and it did. So right away you, you're thinking this is a granular cell tumor. And then you want to really look at the cells for um, mitotic activity, um, variation in the size and shape and nuclear atypia to see how malignant on the spectrum is it. But this was a very benign appearing lesion. Um, we still like to completely excise these because they have malignant potential. And it's a very strange tumor. And as this author put it very clearly, these granular cell tumors are benign while only one to 2% of tumors are malignant. This tumor appears histologically benign. Very rarely a histologically benign appearing lesion may act aggressively. And the only proof of definitive malignancy is metastasis. So until it metastasizes, you don't know it's malignant because it's looking very benign histologically. So that's why we recommend getting these out. Um, it's very infiltrative lesion and it should be taken out completely as recurrences are common after incomplete excision as archives of pathology and lab medicine is stating. So we had the sheets and cords of these polyhedral cells infiltrating between the collagen. Um, in this case, it seemed to be pushing into the collagen, but then in the fat, it was infiltrating some more. Um, the cells have a round central nuclei, um, abundant granular cytoplasm, and they're also known as the um, Abricus Kosoff tumor. Abricosoff, yeah, it's probably Abricosoff tumor. And the other names for it, they had a bunch of different names for this, granular cell myoblastoma, granular cell nerve sheath tumor, granular cell schwannoma, because it may be of Schwann cell origin. That's why the S100 stain is staining. Um, we didn't see much pseudoepithelioma's hyperplasia in this case. Um, and you can see occasional epidermotropism. And you also can verify all this too with the PAS with diastase um, stain. And it's positive typically. And you can occasionally see perineural invasion. So these eosinophilic granules can be surrounded by a halo and they call them so-called pustula ovoid bodies of Milan, um, which were very hard to see here. Um, Anyway, going over the staining characteristics, it can stain positive with PAS with diastase and regular PAS and S100, SOX10, CD68, NSE, CEA, CD57, NKI C3, and um, HMB45 and melan A rarely. And 70% of these lesions are in the head and neck. You'll see the classic tongue lesion. I think Dr. Cockrell showed one of those last week. He showed a classic tongue lesion. The histologic differential is xanthoma, as we, prior, we discussed previously. Xanthogranuloma, typically you'll see um, some Teuton giant cells and um, the S100 in xanthoma is typically um, negative. So that's why we're easily quickly able to dispel any thoughts of it being a xanthoma. Um, granular cell dermatofibroma is typically S100 negative, PAS diastase positive, factor 13 positive and CD68 positive. And there's more granular cells, um, a different look to the granular cells and more fibrous areas. Definitely more fibrosis in the dermatofibroma than you would see here in this just pure granular cell tumor. So the other thing is an AFX can have a granular cell subtype, but typically you'll see some spindled cells there, or you'll see large bizarre cells with um, multi-nucleated cells. So I don't think this looks at all like an AFX, not at all. You would definitely see more atypia in an AFX that had a granular cell type. But if you wanted to do the stains, you could, you could put um, a battery of stains on it and dispel any thoughts of that. Um, the dermal non-neural uh, giant cell tumor can mimic uh, a granular cell tumor. I don't think so because you'll see some giant cells and you don't have any here. So um, if it's an infant, think about the congenital epulis or the congenital gingival granular cell tumor. Typically, you'll see that in newborns, usually girls. It'll be on the alveolar ridge, and it's a polypoid mass. And you'll see granular cells, but no pseudoepithelioma's hyperplasia and atrophy of the re reedy ridges. And it does not recur, and there's no malignant potential. But if it's an infant, think about the congenital epulis. 
Um, granular cells are also seen in many, many other tumors. And I'm not gonna go through this long list. You can all look through it um, on your own time. Um, but these are all the things that you can see granular cells in. So if you see granular cells, don't just jump on a granular cell tumor. There's um, many tumors that can have them. And here's more of the list of where you see granular cells. There's also the dermal non-neural granular cell tumor. And why this is important is that it's negative for S100, SOX10, and HMB45, and SMA. So you might see a proliferation of spindle to epithelioid cells with granular cytoplasm. Think about this dermal non-neural granular cell tumor, AKA the primitive poly polypoid granular cell tumor. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. It's benign, but it should be completely excised, usually, but not always uh, papillonodular polypoid, and it may ulcerate. Extremities, head, neck, and trunk is where it usually occurs. And it's a rare tumor of uncertain lineage. Um, they think it, they should maybe change the name to a granular cell derma root sheath fibroma. Um, typically, it has that expansile growth pattern. The stains, again, we went over them. It's S100 negative and SOX10 negative. So that's why it's different from a regular granular cell tumor. I just wanted you to know about that entity because they love that for tests. <clears throat> Alrighty, um, it's very rare, that entity. I mean, exceedingly rare. You're taking, it's exceedingly rare. Um, this is a shave biopsy that's ulcerated. And we have a proliferation of cells here. The epidermis is mostly absent, but we have some hyperkeratosis here and a little bit of acanthosis and ulceration. On higher power, right away, we're noticing these bodies <clears throat> and we see this eosinophilic fibrillary material in the middle of them someone might confuse that with gout they might say oh is this gout but then if you look closely you'll see that these cells have a somewhat neural appearance and they have this palisaded arrangement around these bodies and these are classic for varicae bodies this is a small schwannoma uh, most of you may have guessed this already it's ulcerated but it's probably more of an Antony A type because most of the cells are spindled and we don't see many myxoid areas like you would see in an Antony B. So this is a small little schwannoma. Um, the reason I'm showing it to you is I didn't want you to confuse these areas with what you would see in gout. If you didn't, if you did think it was gout, you could always try to polarize it. And if you don't see any crystals in the center here of these palisaded areas, then you think, hey, this is neural. And of course, if you look on higher power and you look at these spindled cells, you start to think about um, a neural process. And with the varicae bodies, it's pretty much a slam dunk for a schwannoma. In the skin, typically you have um, schwannomas that may predominate one uh, type of appearance uh, compared to the ones in the other parts of the body. Usually you'll see in other parts of the body, Antony A and Antony B areas. So you'll see cellular areas and myxoid areas. In the skin, sometimes you'll only see Antony A type like in which was what we're seeing here with barricade bodies and cellular areas. So it's a little different in the skin than the rest of the body. So we had a circumscribed um, uh, nodule there, but it wasn't very encapsulated. Typically you'll see more of a capsule. Um, you'll see the delicate neural fibrils and the spindle shaped and wavy nuclei, many of which are arranged in the palisaded pattern. Type B, you'll see abundant myxoid stroma and less barricade bodies. They would love to show you plexiform schwannomas on tests and plexiform neurofibromas. So with a plexiform schwannoma, you'll see multiple nodules going through the dermis. And they love to show you those and you'll find the varicae bodies and then they'll ask you a sequence of follow-up questions on how it's staining and what you see it in and all kinds of secondary questions. So expect to see some kind of plexiform lesion on your test, either a schwannoma or a neurofibroma. Um, <clears throat> Again, if you see the varicae bodies, it's a plexiform schwannoma and you see some acellular areas surrounded by um, nuclear palisades. Um, you'll say, okay, those are the varicase. I've got it. It's a plexiform schwannoma. You'll see some S100 positivity on um, that as well. The keratin will be negative, chromogranin and synaptophysin will also be negative. You'll see occasional mast cells throughout the tumor just sprinkled and hyalinized vessels, some thrombosis. And um, again, as I mentioned earlier, small lesions may just be all Antony A, just like that lesion was. 
And ancient change, watch out for ancient change because it can look very, very ugly. It can look nuclear atypia. And you might get, uh, think, oh, this is malignant, um, but it's not. It's just ancient change in a schwannoma. There's also an entity called a pigmented melanocytic schwannoma um, that can have pigment in it that you can stain with Fontana Masson stain and determine that this is a schwannoma, but it has melan uh, melanin in it. So it's a pigmented melanocytic schwannoma. Also acoustic neuroma is a schwannoma and it's present in the middle ear. I just want you to be aware of it because it's a very common location for a schwannoma of the middle or inner ear. And it's called another name for it is an acoustic neuroma. They sometimes will throw that in on the test, even though it's ENT and it's not derm. Um, melanocytic schwannoma, I want you to know about this variant because they love it on tests. Um, you'll see the encapsulated dermal nodule, interlacing bundles, the neural fibrils, but then you'll see the scattered coarse pigment and it's positive on Fontana Masson. But you can see the pigment without the Fontana Masson. So they can give you this on a test. It is still S100 positive, but the HMB45 and the SOX10 are negative. That helps you differentiate it from a melanoma and it's associated with Carney complex. So keep that on your radar, that, that entity. And then the plexiform schwannoma. Often it's only Antony A areas. You'll see the varicae bodies. Sometimes you don't see varicase but you'll see Antony A areas, you'll see more myxoid areas, and they may be a cellular variant. You'll see axons, mast cells. I mean, axons and mast cells are not seen. That's really important, they're not seen. Um, typically, the S100 strong staining in the multiple nodules that you'll see coursing through the dermis. Um, also consider your differ in your differential of plexiform neurofibroma, which can have thick nerve fascicles surrounded by epineurium. Um, no varicae bodies, and it's often myxomatous too. So they can be difficult to tell apart. And in, in, with neurofibroma, there's the childhood association with uh, neurofibromatosis type one, where you'll see grossly enlarged and tortuous nerves, hypocellular areas with myxoid background and no biphasic pattern. And it may occasionally show nuclear palisading. And it is S100 positive, moderately. Case, oh, I skipped it. You got to the answer already, but that's okay. We have a punch biopsy of another lesion. Um, I put this on so we could compare it to the first lesion that was in the child. Um, this lesion is in an adult. There isn't much of a Gren zone here. And we're seeing some overlying hyperpigmentation. So you might think, well, maybe this is a DF. If you think something's a DF and it has this much of a story form pattern, you might want to back off because this is more of that story form. Some say herring bones, some say chicken wire. I, I like story form. I think this is uh, very story form. It's sort of a world appearance to it, a cartwheel to the cells because they're cut, they're, in, they're fascicles that are cut in all different directions. Um, that's what gives it the story form appearance. And you notice there's somewhat of a, a high NC ratio here, much higher than the mesenchymal looking cells in the first case of the fibrous hamartoma of infancy, this has a much higher NC ratio. So when you go back, compare these two slides and look at the NC ratio here, this is much more worrisome looking because it's so crowded. There's so many cells and it's got this story form pattern. And I don't see my, my friends, my friends are the giant cells and I don't see any giant cells here. So right away, I'm thinking this probably isn't a dermatofibroma, no way. And then I go down into the uh, dermis and I see Swiss cheese the Swiss cheese pattern where the tumor is infiltrating between the fat, whereas the other tumor, the, the mature adipose was part of the tumor. In this tumor, it's infiltrating between the fat. So you have to keep that straight in your head. Um, also, we don't see the fibrous trabeculae. We see actual cells down here infiltrating, and this looks really bad. You can see mitoses. You can even have a fibrosarcomatous uh, areas inside these lesions. And you already know the answer because I I told, I showed you too quickly, but this is a DFSP. Um, and if you didn't believe it, you could start to stain it. You could put a CD34 on here and it was positive for that. Um, and the, the factor 13A was negative. So that fits very well for a DFSP. You'll see some entrapped collagen in this, just like a DF. But when you go to polarize it, it's not polarizable as much as you would see with a DF. And look carefully for giant cells. If you want to say, oh, maybe it's a fibrous histiocytoma. I don't see that many mitoses. 
I don't think the NC ratio is that high. Well, you know, you don't have any giant cells here. And that always helps me with DF. I usually see some giant cells or some foamy cells or something to indicate to me this is a DF. Some areas that might have vasculature, which you'll see in different variants of DF or benign fibrocystic cytoma. So this is, this is a DFSP. This is something we have to completely excise. Um, <clears throat> so you have uniform spindle cells interweaving in a story form pattern into the reticular dermis, extending into the septae and lobules of the subcutis. Um, you must excise the entire thing. Um, usually it's on the trunk, limbs, head, and neck, but not the hands and feet. That's very important. And it has that honeycomb pattern in the fat, the so-called Swiss cheese. Um, and then the chicken wire, that's the crow's foot pattern in the myxoid areas. I didn't see, I don't, I don't really like that, that pattern very much. I'd rather call it story form or hairy bone pattern. And giant cells in some otherwise typical DFSPs, you see a typical DFSP and you do see some giant cells and it looks a high NC ratio and very crowded and spindled cells infiltrating into the fat. Think about a giant cell fibroblastoma. It's a juvenile, and some think it might be a juvenile variant of a DFSP. Um, and typically the epidermis may be thin or it could be thick like a DF. And in this case, we did have some basal hyperpigmentation. So we couldn't use that sign to say it was a DF because we saw basal hyperpigmentation in this case. Gren zone, we didn't see any Gren zone here on our DFSP. And now let's get to the stains, the, the coal one a one the platelet derived growth, growth factor beta, the fusion gene for the translocation 1722. You'll see it in 70% of DFSP cases, and they're definitely like to test you on that. And you'll see it in 100% of the fibrosarcomatous DFSPs. Um, here's um, a good table to help you. Um, this plaque-like dermal fibroma is thrown into the differential, but it will be negative for that fusion gene, the COL1A1 platelet-derived growth factor beta. It'll be negative for that but it will be positive for CD34 and it'll have some factor 13 positivity. So we pretty much eliminated the DF very easily because the CD34 was negative. And the perineuroma, what you wanna do is an EMA. And if you see them staining around the fascicles, you might wanna think about a perineuroma, which is very rare. Um, and you, this EMA can be very helpful with that entity. So this stain will go over your histologic differential and your staining pattern that you can use to differentiate. <clears throat> this lesion. Um, the story form pattern, you got to consider multiple uh, things, the DFSP, the pigmented DFSP, or the Bednar tumor, a dermatofibroma can, it can have a little bit of a story form occasionally, but the CD34 will be negative. You can have the plaque-like dermal fibroma that I showed you in the other chart. Um, typically, um, that will be CD34 positive, and then the COL1A, A1A gene will be um, positive. So that will really help you. You need to do fish for that. You can't do immunohistochemistry, you have to do fish. Um, and we don't have that tested in our lab yet, but we can send that out if we need it. Um, neurofibroma is um, S100 positive, perineuroma, you have the EMA positivity in that entity. Collagenoma, you're gonna see a lot more increase of, of the collagen. Um, and solitary fibrous tumor will look more, much more fibrous than this looked. You'll see more fibrosis but not the eosinophilic collagen that you see in a collagenoma. And malignant fibrous histiocytoma is the total diagnosis of exclusion. And sometimes DFSPs, when they recur multiple times, they can start looking like an MFH because they're going really, really deep. Um, but this is definitely a diagnosis of exclusion for DFSP. The next case um, is a nodular lesion. How much time do we have left? Well, we only have seven minutes left but we have this nodular lesion that at first you might think is neoplastic, but then when you go on higher power, you notice that there's a mixed population of cells. You're seeing some lymphocytes and some histiocytes and some foamy histiocytes. Hmm. As you're searching or during a test, just keep looking. Don't panic that you don't know it in one second and you're starting to see these giant cells and they have a funny characteristic appearance. And then if you see a giant cell that looks like this with a rim of foaminess around the edges, that's a classic Teuton. This you might think is foreign body, but this you would not. That's a classic Teuton type giant cell. And when you see a Teuton like that, and you see this well-circumscribed 
appearance with histiocytes and scattered lymphocytes, think about a xanthogranuloma. <clears throat> then you look, definitely find out what age the patient is. If you're just looking at the slide and you didn't see the patient, you wanna know what age is the patient. Well, the patient's an adult. Yes, you can have xanthogranulomas in adults. And this was an adult patient. So it was a xanthogranuloma. Um, again, that foamy cytoplasm and some of this histiocytes, you might confuse it with a xanthoma, but when you start seeing the Teutons, you'll back away from that and the other inflammatory cells. With xanthoma, you'll see extracellular lipid, PMNs, lymphs, and it can be, you can have an erupted xanthoma, tuberous xanthoma, a tendinous xanthoma. So all of those can be in the differential, but um, for xanthogranuloma, but the Teuton giant cells will back you away from just a plain xanthoma. Also, granular cytoplasm, you see more in the reticulohistiocytoma and a reniform nucleus, you have, to, you have to see that to start thinking about histiocytosis X or Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Xantholasma looks like a xanthoma, but it's a specific location on the eyelid. So in that case, you'd want to know the site of the patient. You really need the site. Would that be, you would not see two tons there. You typically would not. So Xanthogranuloma is a pretty distinct entity, and you should be able to get that on your tests. Um, it is occasional in adults, scalp, head, neck, trunk, limbs, eye, eosinophils, histiocytes, and early lesions. If you see a lot of eosinophils, start thinking about histiocytosis X and reniform nuclei and epidermotropism. So eosinophils should start raising a red flag that you might need to move away from xanthogranuloma. <clears throat> Xanthogranuloma is S100 negative, CD1A negative, um, CD68 positive, <clears throat> and factor 13A positive, CD64 <clears throat> positive. <clears throat> so that's how you differentiate it from histiocytosis X. You'd have S100 positivity and CD1A positivity in histiocytosis X. So that should help you with your differential there if you had to stain it. The histologic differential also includes things like uh, leprosy, because when you see foamy histiocytes, you better think, hey, and you don't see any Teutons, you might want to start thinking about leprosy, and you can have giant cells in leprosy, so you might want to put a fight stain on it. Um, in that case, it didn't look anything like leprosy. It's not in no paraneural involvement, and it didn't wasn't tracking along nerves, and it didn't even have a lepromatous leprosy look because it was a nodule. So that's why I would back off leprosy and I wouldn't even do the stain on that case. Like aniditis and striatus, I don't think it could look like a xanthogranuloma, but it is listed in the differential. So do think about it. Histiocytoma and DF. Yes, a DF, you could think about that with lots of foamy cells, but the Teutons, usually don't see Teutons in DF. You can rarely, but usually not with that much mixed inflammation, the lymphocytes mixed in and other inflammatory cells mixed in. DFs typically don't have that. They can be inflamed DFs and they can get confusing, but you'll see entrapped collagen on the edges of a DF. Reticular histiocytoma, you'll see ground glass cytoplasm. And then you have to rule out the benign cephalic histiocytosis, infants and children under three. Think about it if you see multiple papules on the face and you see EOs, histiocytes, a few foam cells, normal epidermis. It's histologically the same as XG, so it's in the differential. Um, but your S100 could be plus or minus and occasionally a CD1A can be negative. It's a very confusing little entity that you need to know about. Um, hopefully you can rely on the age and the site and the, uh, how, you know, the age of the patient is going to be key. Histiocytosis X, you'll see epidermotropism, S100 positivity, and the CD1A will be positive. Ruptured cyst, you're going to hopefully see some keratin in there. You hopefully see some portion of a cyst wall or a follicle. Um, and intradermal spits, it's melanocytic, so your S100 will be positive. I think um, a spits, you'll, you'll think that the, the cells look um, more melanocytic, so you won't confuse it because the, the nuclear characteristics will be more of a, a melanocytic process. Um, next case. Oh, you know what? We may need to stop because it is, we're getting kind of close to... No, actually we're at 940. No, we can go a little bit further. We can run through the rest of these because some of you probably already looked at them. We have a punch biopsy and it is always a clue. If you have a punch biopsy, think, is it going to be inflam inflammatory? Because they punched it. I mean, it helps. And when you're on a test and you're under pressure, 
um, you might want to think about it's punched and I don't see a neoplasm. The keratin um, layer looks a little bit thickened. The, the uh, epidermis is somewhat thickened, but I don't see squamous in situ atop it. So I don't see a malignancy here. I don't see any nests and nevus cells or anything. So now I'm going to bring my attention down into the dermis where I see vessels that seem to be surrounded by a lymphohistiocytic infiltrate. Um, there's hemorrhage here. There's like a purpuric uh, action going on. It may not be from the procedure. So right away I'm panicking and I'm thinking, could this be vascular? Is this a vascular process? Is this pigmented purpuric? You know, I'm starting to look for fibrin in these vessels, but I'm on a test. So I'm under a lot of pressure and I can't figure out what pattern this is. I'm like, I don't see anything in particular. It doesn't look like a bug bite. I don't see many views. I don't see much sponge up here. So when you start to panic, start looking for bugs. That's what I do. If I can't figure out, I'm like, I better start looking for bugs. Are there any bacteria? Are there any, anything here? Can't see, looks like there might be this, a bit of a sandwich sign here. I'm seeing something going on in this keratin layer but I can't go on, on high power on the derm presenter. So let me go back to, I would stain it. I'm going to stain it because I want to look for, see if anything's going on in that epidermis. There's something, there's somewhat of a sandwich sign. Yep, they're there and they're all over. So if we had a little bit higher power and a bit better, clearer image, we wouldn't even need the PS stain, but there's hyphae all over here. And they look like they are true hyphae. They're not pseudo hyphae and they're not going um, vertically into the epidermis. So this is tinea, this is a tinea infection. I just keep bringing up tinea because I want you to think of it when you have an inflammatory process on a test and you you don't see any pattern that that's recognizable as an entity you can just put it into immediately in a, on a test situation. If we go back to the previous slide, we had a follicle there that we need to hone in on that's not showing up on the, on the PAS. Inside the follicle, there are some spores. You can see tons of spores and some hyphae in here. So we have an uh, endothrix and an ectothrix. So there's some inside that follicle um, so we have a tinea infection, um, obviously a fungal infection and dermatophytosis of keratin component of hair, skin, and nails, usually microsporum, trichophyton, or epidermophyton, dermatophytosis, um, dermatomycosis, epidermomycosis, and millions of names for this, any superficial fungal infection caused by dermatophyte. Um, it's still considered superficial fungal, even though it's in the hair. It's not deep fungal. Deep fungal would be more into the dermis and you'd see it in the giant cells. You'd see it in histiocytes being engulfed. Um, a dermatophyte is a fungal parasite upon the skin, usually a species of microsporum, as we mentioned earlier. Dermatiaceous, those are the ones with the dark conidia. If you start seeing pigmented conidia, think about a dermatiaceous uh, process like sporotrichosis, perhaps tinea nigra, things of that nature. Um, tinea infection, the sandwich sign, again, you can see it in gut tape, pleva and PRP, but if you need to do your stains, PS for fungus, GMS, or wet prep KOH. Now let's move on to the next case. This is somewhat interesting, a little bit esoteric. We don't have any epidermis attached. We have this soft tissue, um, piece of soft tissue, basically with a process that's involving all of the soft tissue. We're seeing innumerable cells here, and the cells look somewhat neural. They look somewhat fibrohistiocytic. We don't see any pigment. The cells are small, and we're searching and searching and searching for mitoses. This isn't a very clear image, so if anyone wants to see this image and the 11 other slides that composed this tumor, this is a tumor. I'm showing you this is somewhat esoteric. It's a tumor in a 24-year-old in the shoulder that was invading somewhat into almost into the bursa and see this might be part of the bursa here that area we don't have overlying epidermis but there was a huge uh, space between the epidermis and this subcutaneous tumor um, all the tumor looked the same there were not many mitoses so um, it looked somewhat neural and somewhat fibrohistiocytic at the same time even my myofibroblastic some would say 
um, didn't see many mitoses. So we have to think of what are we going to call this tumor? And we had to have a battery of stains. The reason I'm showing it to you is the very unusual tumor that you might run across in your career. We're not seeing any barricade bodies. We're not seeing any pigment in this slide, although there were areas that had some pigment um, that might, might make you think about some kind of blue nevus, maybe some large plaque-like blue nevus or possibly some huge, um, you thought maybe you thought about neurothechioma or possibly um, some kind of fibrohistiocytic tumor. And that's what this turned out to be. We actually stained it. The S100 was negative, the SOX10 was negative, the factor 13A was positive, and the CD34 was negative. So we found this to be a rare mesenchymal neoplasm of intermediate malignancy, the plexiform fibrohistiocytic tumor. It was first reported by Engzinger and Zhang in 88, predilection for children, young adults. This was in a 24-year-old, but it had been growing for years in the shoulder, this case. It can occur at any age and it can involve upper limbs as slow growing painless mass with a low malignant potential. Um, it does need to be completely excised because rarely it can metastasize. So they have to go in and get this out. This was about five centimeters and it had a nodular appearance, thus the plexiform nature of the tumor. But because it lacked the S100 positivity, we couldn't call it uh, any kind of neurofibroma or schwannoma or any other tumor of neural lineage. So it had to be thrown into this area, this intermediate area of fibrohistiocytic tumor. It's usually deep dermal and subcutaneous and has the ray-like extensions into skeletal muscle and adipose. The overlying epidermis and dermis are usually normal and it was in this case. Um, it has a plexiform or multinodular uh, appearance and it's a proliferation of these fibrohistiocytic like cells with minimal atypia. You can occasionally see osteoclast like giant cells and we didn't see any of those and we didn't see much inflammation in the tumor. There's a little inflammation around it, but not in the tumor, not very much at all. Um, there's usually nodule, nodules and that plexiform is what we mean by plexiform. You see multiple nodules, think plexiform, <clears throat> prominent dilated vessels, and it can be more sclerotic than MFH, but it didn't have that dense um, story form appearance of an MFH. DFSP is in the differential. Uh, this was CD34 negative. Um, so we completely eliminated that as a possibility because it was such a strong, um, completely negative CD34 staining. Um, you can see hemorrhage in these and hemocytorin, and it, there can be vascular invasion in 10 to 20%. Usually the mitoses are very low. I searched 11 slides for hours and couldn't find a single mitosis because I was really wondering, what is the, the potential of this lesion? Is this going to come back? Is this going to, you know, is this going to be a problem or metastasize in the future? So it really had a low malignant potential look to it because there wasn't many mitoses and the cells looked very bland. And um, so probably this will be an excellent prognosis once they get it all out. <clears throat> so there are some subtypes of this entity um, and the stain is S100. Occasionally 10 can be plus or minus. Factor 13 is usually positive. CD68 is positive. Keratin is negative. Desmond is negative and smooth muscle actin can occasionally be positive and sometimes it's negative. In our case, it was negative. The vimentin um, is typically positive, but it doesn't help you very much in the differential vimentin. <clears throat> Next case is a nice tiny little tumor. On low power, it even looked a little bit like that XG, but it's not. It's another little nodule and it was in a, a mucocutaneous location. It was in the face around the lips. Um, <clears throat> So we have a nice, well-circumscribed nodule. Some of you may have already guessed what this is. <clears throat> we have fascicles with these cleft-like spaces around it. We have a tiny connective tissue capsule around this lesion. <clears throat> I used to think these looked a little bit like a schwannoma and I'd like to argue, hey, that looks like a little varicay, but it's back off that idea. When you see this overall pattern on low power, think about the palisaded encapsulated neuroma, the so-called thumbprint pattern. <clears throat> this is a PEN. Um, why isn't it a traumatic neuroma? Well, typically you have multiple nodules with that and fibrosis around the nodules. Um, this is a classic um, palisade encapsulated neuroma. It's a solitary circumscribed neuroma is another name for it. Consists of nerve fascicles with a suggestion of nuclear palisading. 
um, there's clefts between the cells and there's no intervening collagen. One thing you might want to do if you were thinking about a traumatic neuroma, if it was like, let's say, like a Morton's neuroma between the third and fourth web space on the foot, you might want to do the EMA or, and you'll see it staining around each nerve tw twig. So within this type of neuroma, the EMA will be positive around the whole neuroma. So that can help you differentiate between a tra traumatic neuroma and a PEN. But if you are on the foot and you are on the web space, think about a Morton's neuroma first before you jump on PEN. Think about your location. It's nice to know the location and it's, a, it's very important to know location. Uh, so the thumbprint is that classic pattern. The superficial part may resemble a neurofibroma. Sometimes we'll get shaves just to the top of this and we might think it looks like a neurofibroma and then you might, for some reason, you might wanna take it out for cosmetic reasons and we find out later it's a PEN. So you'll have to forgive us for that because sometimes we only have the top of the lesion. Traumatic neuroma is in the differential. It has that fibrotic stroma around the fascicles. PEN does not. The S100 is positive with this entity and the EMA is positive at the periphery. Again, the mucocutaneous location is classic in adults. There are other sites and it can occur on the arm. I've had them on the arm. So, I mean, not me, but patients I've looked at. Anyway, so consider cellular neurotheek, but with neurotheek, you're going to see packets of little groupings of cells that look slightly neural looking and your S100 is negative and your CD63 is positive and you don't have any clefts with neurothechioma and you will see an occasional mitosis with neurothechioma. So neurothechioma is in the differential. We'll show you one of those, so don't worry, don't panic. We'll show you one of those. We'll show you many of those, so just stick with the show. And uh, all right, we have this punch biopsy and um, we have a very, um, very vesicular process here. Vesicular and spongiotic, there's intraepidermal vesicles and there's this big subepidermal -epi sub edema. It almost has a little bit of a gossamer look to it. Um, again, though, with these intraepidermal vesicles, I thought about a bug bite when I looked at this on low power, but it isn't really wedge shaped. Um, it's not a wedge shaped process. It's going side to side and then when you go on higher power, you do see many, many eosinophils in this process, and it's lymphohistiocytic. It's around the vessels. And I think with this degree of intraepidermal um, vesicles and you have spongiosis, you need to think about an allergic contact derm that's in a very acute phase. Um, this actually turned out to be a plant, um, a reaction to plant, and the plant happens to be poison ivy. So this is a Roos dermatitis, spongiotic, slightly psoriasis form dermatitis with lymphocytes and scattered eos and an edematous papillary dermis. Conspicuous presence of eos, a lack of neutrophils is really important. And you'll see some, some acantholysis there where this, it's a more of a spongiotic acantholysis though. And it's very typical of a delay type hypersensitivity as an allergic contact derm, which may be seen in Roos dermatitis. So it's a type of allergic contact derm, and we know for a fact they had an exposure to poison ivy. It was biopsied, um, which we're very lucky to have that slide because it doesn't usually get biopsied, which is why I saved the slide for you all to see it. So I hope you enjoyed that one. <laughs> we may never get one of those again. All right, so let's see. This is a shave biopsy, turn on its side. Now we have it. Uh, let's go to another piece. I don't like this piece. I don't like that one. I like the one up here better. All right. So we have this process that looks lichenoid. We have an acanthotic epidermis. And right away, what stands out to me is this hypergranulosis. It's sort of a wedge-shaped hypergranulosis. And we're noticing the blurring of the, of, at the junction. And if we look on higher power, we do see some apoptotic cells scattered throughout. And occasional, this is mostly lymphohistiocytic, but we will see an occasional uh, melanophages in here, which you can see. This turned out to be um, on the shin and this degree of acanthosis, you might wanna think about something like, um, well, you think about a BLK, 
but there were multiple nodule, uh, multiple lesions, multiple papules. So one of the things that we would think about is um, lichen planus, um, because this was not a solitary process, and we have these beautiful savat bodies. Um, and I think this is good enough to call it a, a hypertrophic lichen planus. It was on the shin, which is a classic location. So this is pretty classic, but always look at this granular layer. It's really important you focus on this granular layer because if you see that hypergranulosis atop this lichenoid process and this sawtooth pattern and, this, and you see apoptotic cells, colloid bodies, savat bodies, whatever you want to call them, think about lichen planus. Um, and this was somewhat acanthotic, although I've seen them very acanthotic and, and they are hypertrophic uh, lichen planus. Um, so we see hyperkeratosis, wedge-shaped hypergranulosis, acanthosis, degeneration of the basal layer, and a band-like infiltrate of lymphocytes and histiocytes in the superficial dermis. We did not see many EOs at all. Um, cytoid bodies, they can have some IgM positivity on, in site, um, in, on fluorescence and some C3. Um, we don't usually get these for DIF. Um, you can rarely see EOs. Um, it's usually pretty rare. When I start to see EOs in a lichenoid process, I start thinking about drug, um, uh, drug uh, processes, lichenoid drug eruptions. But um, this didn't have many EOs in this particular case. Um, this was multiple lesions, and we, had, uh, we did have a clinical history of lichen planus. Otherwise, if this was a solitary lesion, someone might think of a benign lichenoid keratosis. Um, lichen planus can be in the flexural forearm, wrist, hand, leg, lumbar, genital, oral. We've seen quite a few oral lesions. Typically, the hypertrophic variant is on the shin, and those have to be watched very, very closely because we have cases that will evolve into, well, it's not a premalignant lesion, but it's associated with squamous cells and KAs. And we've seen cases where someone's had a long-standing hypertrophic LP, and then they'll develop a KA nearby and near it. So you have to watch those very closely, those lesions. They start looking bad. You might want to biopsy, re-biopsy them. Um, they're very pyritic lesions. Rarely they can occur in a linear array or a zostera form along Blasco's lines. So keep that in mind when you think about lichen planus. Consider lichenoid drug eruption. We already talked about that. Um, if we saw a lot more EOs, we had some interface change there. Lichenoid drug eruption can mimic it. Lichenoid photoderm can mimic it, but you'll see sunburn cells and EOs. Sunburn cells will typically percolate upwards. They won't stay along the basal layer like apoptotic bodies. Lichen sclerosis, well, you'll see the early inflammatory lesion can mimic lichen planus. Typically not the more long-standing lichen sclerosis where you'll see the homogenization of the collagen. Um, atrophic LP, the epidermis will get really thin looking, almost actinic thin looking. And then hypertrophic LP, watch out with those lesions. Um, they can easily be overcalled into something else and you don't wanna overcall hypertrophic LP. Bullous LP, you can get the cleft at the, at the junction and it can form a bullous uh, lesion. And you should do tinea if you have any suspicion this could be a fungal infection. DSAP, you got to look for the coronoid lamellae. You got to look for them. Um, if you don't, you know, you could miss a DSAP. Sometimes DSAP can be inflamed, you know. So the variants are hypertrophic, atrophic, bullous, or vesicular. And then the resolving lesion, you should have a history of LP. And the mucous membrane, we see it often on the mucous membrane, the floor of the mouth, the palate, the tongue, the lips, the gingiva, the buccal mucosa. Again, you can see a little bit hypergranulosis on a, on a lesion that's in the mouth where you usually don't see much of a granular layer. So that can be very helpful inside the mouth when you see that because you don't have much keratin. Um, you don't have any keratin in the mouth, but you can see a little hyperkeratosis atop an LP in the mouth. So when you start seeing that, start thinking about LP and in in oral LP. We see that all the time here. A lot, a lot of them on the lips. We'll see it on the lip, right inside the lip. Okay, it's not opening. We're on our last slide. Whoopsie daisy. And we have plenty of time. We have two minutes to do this and it will be fast because on Durham Presenter, we can't go to the high power on case 14 that I would like to go on. So oh, flip it around again. So we have a diffuse process in the dermis. The whole entire dermis has been overtaken by cells um, and the cells appear to be one cell type. They seem to be histiocytes. And there's these funny vacuoles. I don't see many giant cells. 
So when I see this diffuse process, I start thinking about, I better think about staining this thing because I see some foaminess to the cytoplasm of these cells and I don't see many giant cells, but if we look hard enough, I'm sure we may find one or two, but um, when you go on high power, always look inside the cytoplasm of these cells, see if you can see any bacteria. In the case of uh, Klebsiella um, granuloma inguinale, LGV, you can see Klebsiella, but they're tiny, so tiny bacteria. Um, with histoplasmosis, you'll see something here. And I can't go on any higher power, but if you look, there's a marquee sign here where these organisms are rimming this vacuole and there's tiny dots and we have to go on higher power. And when you start straining to see something on the highest power you're on inside the cytoplasm of these engorged histiocytes, then start thinking about your differential of histoplasmosis versus leishmaniasis. And when you see a marquee sign where they're rimming the outside of this vacuole, this cytoplasmic, it's a, almost a cytoplasmic vacuole, think about leishmaniasis. And that's what this was. You have to see the kinetoplast, which looks like a safety pin of these amastigotes. It's due to the sandfly bite. And um, this is the cutaneous type of leishmaniasis. Come to my office. I'll be happy to show you the slide that we saw last week. Um, it was a beautiful case. It's teeming with organisms and you can really study it. So you can study and look for the kinetoplast because they're going to put histo on, on the derm path boards, they will. They'll put histo on there, which is usually intracytoplasmic, and they'll or they'll put leishmaniasis on there, and you have to be able to tell the difference. So with histo, you'll see a little clearing around the ovoid structure, the yeast, and they're tiny yeast. These are two to four microns. They're tiny, and uh, you have to strain to see it, and you look in the cytoplasm. So again, when you get desperate and you say, that's not a, a xanthogranuloma, I don't see the tons. What is this histiocytic process? Start looking for bugs. That's what I keep telling everyone. Let's look for the bugs. So this was Leish leishmaniasis. Too bad we couldn't get Durham presenter to go higher. Um, Gimsa, you need the Gimsa stain if you want to really look hard. Um, again, and, and uh, fungus won't stain uh, typically. You'll stain fungus more with PAS and GMS. With leishmaniasis, it'll be negative on PAS and GMS, but the GEMSA will be positive. It'll stain the organisms blue. So that's what you really need to know about um, is which stain to do on that. And leishmaniasis, remember the other types, just briefly you know, look over that because they might show you espundia or they uh, were mucocutaneous. Um, we are seeing it in Texas. It's usually leishmaniasis, um, the Mexicana uh, variant. And um, visceral, think of Cala Azar, it'll go to the spleen or liver and that's the black death. So you have to know these other types because they're gonna ask you secondary questions. So Brazilensis um, is Espundia, the destructive mucocutaneous form. And um, remember what stains to do with histo, it's gonna be GMS positive, gamorimethamine silver positive and PAS positive and histoplasma, no kinetoplast. It is a halo where that's the capsule around histoplasma. Um, histoplasmosis, the yeast have a capsule, but they're much smaller than blasto. Blastomycosis is broad-based budding and they're bigger. And you're going to see them extracellularly. So don't confuse histo and blasto. That's just, that's just a basic rule. It's not, it's a generalization. So um, that's what you want to look for. So I'm just giving you clues. Not everything is a perfect uh, clue. Anyway, that's the end of the show. Um, We'll definitely show you other lesions that will bring this differential together. So we'll see you next time. Bye, folks.